We walked into the scriptorium to the writing room. <coughs> this is the eighth lesson, and we'll be working on uh, um, plate 10, the capitals with the slab serif and uh, the swash. In between the, sla the slab serif and the swash work, however, we'll take a short visit to Root Valley School in uh, just outside Vancouver, Washington. Now, these capitals <coughs> are very important because they are more than the raw, simple capitals which we had last time. Those really are not to be used, I'd say, because they lack the serif, they lack the finishing stroke. But as I said last time, we work with them because all capitals, no matter how flourished they may be or how they're finished, must have at a base the structure of the simple capital. You notice the D here will have uh, the slab serif at the head and at the foot. The G will have a serif at the head. The H will have serifs at the head and foot. But uh, the essential letter that we did last week is there and is unchanged. Well, let's look at the C. <coughs> now, you'll notice that the C has a different ending than the slab. In order to save time and space, I put this more complex serif on. If it had the simple slab, we would just lay that stroke down like this. But I don't think this is as satisfying as that. And I'll show you in a moment how that is done. The uh, <coughs> G has the same head, uh, the same arm serif. Swing it around. Lower the lower arm just as you raise the top arm. And then the E has a, the same sort of serif. F will have it too. And then the S has the same arm serif, as I call it. Now, how does that arm serif work? You rotate on the upper part of the serif, and I'll show you here with a large pen. It's difficult to see with a small pen how that happens. You actually rotate on the upper right-hand corner like this. It has to be done rather fast in order to come out right. That's the way it should look. You start with a pen angle here, and as you go around, you change the pen angle and the edge angle until it's up like this, almost vertical, and then pull it down slightly. That is very tricky. You won't be able to get it right at once, but practice it. It'll give you something to do on a rainy Sunday afternoon. When the arm of E has that sort of terminal, it's the same sort of thing, but it's straight, and then we get this fillet in here for, as part of the arm serif. <coughs> The uh, simplest way is to uh, just lay the slab on like this. But it very often will leave a little bit of white in there. But that you might try and work with that sort of serif on C, G, S, and even put that serif on your E. Just tip, uh, steepen the pen's edge and then put that stroke in. And that serves as a finishing stroke to make a more complete-looking letter. Now let's go back to the C and do that again with your broad nib. You rotate and then drag down a little bit. <coughs> I'll take a fresh sheet of paper with this. Be sure that the pen is held so that the edge makes but a 15 degree angle with the horizontal. And then you will find that the verticals are much heavier than the horizontals and you'll get a much better looking letter of firmer construction. and keep this low down here. So if it's lifted up, the letter will look 
very weak. You don't need to do the Q because it has no such staff. Although in uh, the Flourish cap, we'll take a different Q. Now the H has these slabs. And notice, please, that this is what the printers call cut. It's a slightly concave stroke with the concavity above, down at the foot, the concavity is below, so that it's concave here, concave here. We lay that crossbar on the midline and finish the serif while you're there. Don't go back for anything. The A, lift the pen, lay that concave stroke down. A very simple, flat pen angle, and the stroke is not complex at all. Go on top up there, pull it down, and a half serif in here. It doesn't need the full serif because it's about not pulling this foot serif way over so the VA looks like a deep delta with a bar part way up. And let's steepen the pen angle for the first stroke of N. Otherwise, all three strokes of N will have the same weight. The concave stroke. Now, very horizontal. And down like this. Now go up on the left corner. Can you see that all right? Put the slab serif in. Steepen the pen angle. And with your eye on the first stroke for part of the time, then your eye on that point come down, and then go up on the right corner of the pen. Then you have that point down there. Let me show you with a larger pen how we do that. Come down with the diagonal stroke and go up on the left corner. Come down with the pen steeper and go up on the right corner. Now, if the ink doesn't flood in, and with most pens it will flood in if you have a small pen, you can poke it around a little bit and shove the ink in the place like that. <coughs> the T, begin, I'd say, with a simple diagonal like that. Put a fill it in, come down, and lay the slab in. U. Z. When you start the downstroke, clear to the right of that slab there. I'll go up on the left corner. Come down and go up on the right corner. That will give you a point down here. X. Lay the slab down, concave. Come down steeply. Put the concave stroke in. And the concave head there. Go over above center, and then put the concave slab down. The Y, as with the V, keep the serif mostly out away from the counter. Don't have it getting into the counter. And then. Mm. Which is the same as it's always been. You might put the tick in, though. <coughs> now let's try the B for the next width group. Keep that pen's edge down. Remember, show your hands this image of touch and movement and see if the hands can't copy it. Talking, I didn't make a good beat. Let me do it over again. I had the upper counter too large. That's a better one, I think. <coughs> uh, e, flat pen angle, lift the pen, and a lighter horizontal. And a light horizontal. Twist on the corner. Twist on the corner. F. Very much like E. This is the second stroke. Now lower 
to the limb arm, to the second arm. J. Simple enough. Oh. L. Lift and lower. You don't need to put a sheriff out there, I think. The P. Now, in the book, I have a, an arched stroke up here for the P. And then the R has a slightly different stroke. Well, choose the one that you like best. The R has a slight shouldering on it, which I think makes a stronger letter. I prefer this to that. But you take the one that you prefer. And we have the S again with that tricky serif. You don't put a serif in the bottom. It's not considered necessary because in our rapid reading, we, our eyes tend to focus on the tops of letters, not on the part next to the uh, writing line. So that will make the S. M, just about the way you'd fix the M or the A, but keep this very horizontal and strong. Don't let it droop. And I don't get a curve up here. You have a stronger letter if you keep it this way. Up on the corner for that central V. Up on the other corner. And poke the ink in. Now, I recommend that you put that little mark in there so that you can make the final stroke with a very flat pen. Let me do this. It's a little difficult, a little tricky, unless you can see it. So let's write it with a big pen so that we see what we're doing. I'll make the whole letter. Strong horizontal. Now I'll get the diagonal. Down steep, way over on the third stroke. Whoops, it skidded up on the right-hand corner. Now, what I want is to be able to get the flat pen in here, but you see, with that cut off at that steep angle, it won't work so well. So that will enable me to get in here with quite a flat pen angle and come down and complete the letter like that. And I lift and make that cut. The W is the one letter that's left before we take our visit. And you can see by now how that is done, I think. We've, we've already worked with the two ampersands, uh, two of the ampersands that are here in the book. Let's take the earliest one. Now, this is a medieval ampersand, and you see it in Renaissance manuscripts. It's more like an E here. This, uh, the, the crossbar on the T was usually omitted. In England, in the handwriting movement, this is their ampersand. And you wonder how that could be an ampersand, but it's this old one that sometimes was closed, like that. So let's stop now and uh, take a visit with these beautiful children at the Fruit Valley School in Vancouver, Washington. My name is Jean Mack. This program was started this year through a federally funded project to work with gifted children. And these children were selected because they had artistic talent. And uh, they meet once a week for one hour to work on italic. And italic was selected because another teacher and I have a great love for it. And we have been trying to get something started with it for some time. And this seemed the opportune moment. So we took it. And uh, each week we have two people from the outside come and work with the kids. And um, Miss Van Auken and myself have worked at, at times when we can get away from our classrooms. And the enthusiasm has been so great that we've even had kids come before school and kids come up and say, can I get into the program? And of course we don't have really enough teachers to work with a great number of students. So this is developed into a program for next year. And our teachers are coming on Wednesday night and learning italic. And next year, we hope to be teaching it to the whole school. So it's something that's really caught on. And it's been really exciting. 
Leanne Van Aachen, first grade teacher at Fruit Valley. I'm using the italic program, materials from the Chuck Lehman, uh, Bob Palladino, and Lloyd Reynolds book. And we're using it as, as a total handwriting program at a first grade level, uh, working with letter forms, shapes, and the slope of the letters. And we're not into joins nor using the pen. And the goal is to create a handwriting that is beautiful to look at and as well as easy to write. Um, the consistency between first grade and third grade when they go into the traditional cursive, I feel is lacking in the handwriting program. So we've uh, trying to use a pro or starting to use a program that will be consistent from K through sixth grade. Um, each year adding different uh, skills, the joins, the pins. You bring it up way, but then you go back here and you make a nice little round top. Yes, okay. okay. Now, do you, can you read that? No. All right, let's look at it. It says gate. <laughs> you say it. Gate. Mm -hmm. You know what a gate is, don't you? Uh-huh. All right. All right, I'll let you try writing it now. It's like a fence, but it's different. Yes, it's a door in a fence. Yeah. It's a door in a fence. All right. <laughs> this is my first visit to the Fruit Valley School. Uh, just uh, in Vancouver, Washington. And as always, it's a thrill to see these wonderful children uh, and with their, all their enthusiasm for the italic writing. Some years back, uh, teachers might have said that it's too complex for the child, it's too difficult for him. But this school and dozens and dozens of others which I visited show that the children love the hand and it's not too difficult for them at all. And when you have a teacher who is enthusiastic about it, that enthusiasm is something that the child will catch. And generally, the children do incredibly good work. The italic hand is the one, as uh, the teacher said, which uh, avoids that traumatic break between the print script and the commercial cursive. Uh, the italic can begin with a pencil and then continue in the late third or, or fourth year with the edge pen. It is the best handwriting available, and uh, the children, I think, deserve the best. All children do. Certainly, uh, you can see how wonderful they are here and what great powers of concentration they have in working for but a short time. Uh, they haven't had much experience with italic, and yet they're doing remarkably well with one hour a week and only a few meetings. Well, let's, after that break, let's go back and see what we can do with the flourish cap. Now, flourishes are dangerous, and one of the things wrong with 17th, 18th, and 19th century handwriting is that the flourishes became very contrived and very artificial. But a flourish is a sign of exuberance, as Eric Gill said, and you shouldn't flourish unless the pen is working well, the ink, and the paper, so that you feel there's something joyous about the writing. Now keep the flourishes relatively simple, I'd say. If the paper was smoother, that would be easier to push over. Now since this curves up, I wouldn't curve this up too, so I would put a serif, a quiet foot serif, in contrast to that curve. Oh. The next letter we have is an M, and it can have the same curve. You don't let that flourish droop. Don't let it come down at an angle. Keep it strong and straight. Go up in the corner, push over, and down and up on the other corner. Another head for M that works very well in the last stroke. Is this one. I rather like the sharpness of that, uh, giving a biting quality to it. 
to the letter. The U, again, plenty of air in here. You don't want that too close to the main part of the letter. This can have a bracketed serif at the top. This may curve up a little, but it might be better to make it absolutely straight. The V can have a full curve like that. Now don't pinch that, don't make it narrow. Let it be a beautiful full swing. And bring this out, come down and cut into that. Uh, an exciting letter. The X, we don't need to uh, demonstrate. I think that's clear enough. The same thing in X and Y both need that full, beautiful full curve. With the two, one of the two stroke Y's is this. That's an excellent one. A more difficult Y, which I don't, uh, wouldn't expect you to use right away, but practice it if you like it. It's uh, difficult because the student cannot believe this sudden and rather ugly angle in here. But notice what happens when I pull this last stroke down. It looks as if this flourish were part of the second stroke instead of being part of the first stroke. But it's a very handsome Y, and that is probably too smooth a curve and wouldn't work as well. So get this rather quick break like that, a rather quick angle, and come over and down into that. Now, how do you hit this at the right moment? Or how do you avoid missing it? The thing to do is to focus your eyes on it and with your hand uh, being directed out of the corner of your eye or by peripheral vision, you can come down and keep your appointment there. <coughs> In, um, say, just take K. I like it better, and I think you may too, if this doesn't overpower the foot there. By that I mean it looks a little weak to me to have this short and this come way out. This is better. The foot serif should probably be stronger than the one above so that it won't run the danger of looking top heavy. Now this is a much more satisfactory H than the one that we had with the slab serif. The one with the slab serif is rather dull because all four serifs are alike and it just looks like a goalpost on a football field. This has no two which are alike. That is, the four um, make it much more interesting as a letter design. <coughs> the uh, L can have a curve, which is graceful, and then swing to the left like this and then over. Now this should not come down this way. Because if this is too abrupt, it's going to look weak. It's going to look as if this could slip right off this horizontal. It's firmer to have this go into the horizontal and then, after going to the left for a while, come back to the right. It's a good, solid construction. If you write the A with that sort of foot serif, you move over to the right like that. It goes to the left a bit before it turns to the right. And the uh, <coughs> M, it can have that push. In the rapid handwriting, you'll probably prefer that kind of construction. Now, this should come farther over, I think. Way over for the V part of the M. Then a rather flat M with a nice, strong, bracketed serif up in here. Again, if you have, no, that's not deep enough you have that added touch, you can come in with a strong bracketed serif, and it looks as if it were carefully drawn. It looks quite complex, but it's a very, very simple thing. Just a slight twist of the pen like that, that's all, and you have a finished, drawn-looking serif. We have a V, which was very popular in Renaissance Italy, and I like it very much. A reverse curve here, and then over here, this shoots down. It's a handsome letter of the same sort of 
design might be used on the W for reverse curves. Generally, we avo avoid reverse curves because they're dangerous. They're easily overdone. That probably has a little too much. If this were, uh, had the reverse curve and this straight, I think we'd like it better. Let's try it. As I said last time, watch the movement of the pen because that's what it's all about. Writing is a system of movements involving touch, and what they do is leave a, um, a track. Well, one can read track. What kind of animal left that track? What was he like? Was the animal frightened? Was he afraid of things? Was he angry? Was he extremely aggressive? These things are likely to show up in the track that your pen reads when you're riding. So move that edge, and the edge leaves the track. You watch the track, and you watch it uncritically. Don't be harsh on yourself. Don't be harsh with the anything. Or don't be overly pleased. Just watch the movement of the pen, the movement of the pen's edge, and the beautiful track which is left by the pen. The TH bothers many beginners, and that I think is a quite possible TH. Only let's get more contrast this time between the strong vertical and a slightly lighter horizontal. I think that's enough.